I hate the undead. My grandfather hated them too, even before they put out his eyes. Did you think I'd be out here on the frontier without good reason? Yes, Altdorf needs a strong frontier. No, Altdorf doesn't need unwashed zombies at her gates. So that's why I'm here, to bring Imperial order to stinking undead. Revenge? That'd be good too. This war against the Karsteins won't last long, and when it's done, I've got plans. This is all about power. Power in Altdorf. Going down that road means dealing with all my rivals. The magic colleges, the dwarfs, that mad one-eyed freak in the north. The Elector counts families too. After all, the man who controls Altdorf rules the world. And one day, I will be Emperor. Welcome everyone, Quistine here with the discussion about Carl Franz, the original campaign in Warhammer 1. And also just to talk about how it compares to the campaign that he does have in Warhammer 3. Because in Warhammer 3 is a pretty awful campaign. Now, I'm over here against Azag and Grimgor. Yeah, back when Azag was part of Grimgor's faction and they would unleash a biblical kind of death and destruction. You know, we talk about Thunderdomes, we talk about the Lustrian Thunderdome, we talk about the Southlands Thunderdome in Warhammer 3, but we should talk about the original Thunderdome, the OG Thunderdome over here in the Battlelands between the Dwarves and the Greenskins, because this was quite a biblical fight back in Warhammer 1. So if you're playing as Grimgor, you had a pretty harsh road against the Dwarves, uh, mm, largely because of Karakazul over here. But if you were playing the, uh, the dwarves, you had a nightmare because you had you started a war with a lot of the greenskin factions, in which Grimgor would soon join in. That made things complicated, to, to say the least. Now, to be clear, I think Warhammer Free in terms of campaign mechanics is far better overall than. Warhammer 1 and Warhammer 2. The climate situation, the diplomacy options, etc, etc. But there are certainly some campaigns that either are really good, even in Warhammer 1, even if they are good in Warhammer 3, like Grimgor's campaign is certainly really good in in uh, Warhammer 3. Who calls? Or, uh, or there are campaigns that just haven't aged all that well. Carl Franz's campaign in Warhammer Free is Ready one of the serve. worst campaigns in the entire game. In fact, it's also one of the worst Imperial campaigns in the game as well. But that wasn't the case in Warhammer 1. In Warhammer 1, you could genuinely consider this a recommended campaign and it would hold true. Now, this is a turn 50 campaign. The Warriors of Chaos are gonna show up in like 10 turns over here. And uh, in this entire campaign so far, I've only had to fight one manual battle, and that's been a quest battle. Everything else that I've achieved has been through auto resolve. That's partly because of good decision making on my part to avoid some of the harsher battles. Like I didn't just go YOLO and try and annihilate Marienburg early on in the campaign. So that has ended up working for me pretty well. I kind of regret wiping out Skarsenik as quickly as I did because, uh, well, I do have a quest over here for Galmaraz that does require me to defeat five armies belonging to the Greenskins. That's why I'm in the Badlands, which is not a great ideal idea to find yourself in that situation if you're playing Karl Franz. It would have been far better if I had been able to leave Skarsenik, but Skarsenik I like. 40 turns ago, basically, like, I reunified the Reichland, dealt with the Imperial Secessionist, and then just like, oh yeah, who's my next victim? Right, Skarsnik, wipe my out. Now, the reason I was able to avoid a lot of the manual battles is because, well, I didn't encounter any other legendary lord until this point, with the exception of Vlad, I've been in a few tussles with Vlad. Uh, but Vlad's also been at war with a number of factions, suffice to say, so he's been weakened by that. So it's only really Grimgor at this point that I'm actually having to put some effort into fighting a manual, manual battle. And while I understand that people think that there should be more battles, some people really uh, enjoy that aspect of the game, I think when it comes to battles in a campaign, in a Warhammer game, in a total war game in general, the kind of battles you want to fight and the battles that 
like you um, you should be forced to fight in a campaign are battles of this nature, battles against genuinely strong opponents or legendary lords that can put up a serious enough challenge. Though certainly the balance over here is not great, because by not fighting so many battles throughout the campaign, well, imagine you're a new player Champion getting into this and you just faith. auto resolve your way until this point and then you have to deal with Grimgor. Sigmarite that uh, can blow up in your face, uh, su suffice to say. But why is Karl Franz's campaign so good in Warhammer 1 compared to Warhammer 3? And hell, even Warhammer 2. Well, you start in Altdorf and you can't really take Gurenberg turn 1, but you just can wipe out an army of the Imperial Secessionists, deal with the Imperial Secessionists very, very quickly, and you find yourself in a relatively, and I use the word relative very strongly here, but in a relatively strong position. Uh, the only threats are Greenskins, Kazrak, and, well, Skarsnik, who aren't, isn't much of a threat to begin with. His Night Goblin army is not going to be able to hold his own against your army is. of, well, crossbowmen and uh, spearmen and shields. He just will not be able to win that. DLC does help Servant out, to be sure, but you don't necessarily need it. The regiments right now are nice benefit absolutely especially the artillery one because otherwise it's going to take a while to be able to get your hands on the artillery but you are in a relatively safe position and you have all of the room to expand however way you want also you are not limited by a crap system in terms of engaging in wars with the electric counts and that's precisely what i ended up doing over here i engaged in Several wars against the Electric Counts, that's how I stuck Sterling, uh, whereas Everland, I, well, Vlad had wiped them out, he overextended himself, and I was able to take advantage of that to take Averheim from him. You could argue that not necessarily a whole lot has happened during the course of this campaign, and that's absolutely true. Not necessarily a whole lot has happened, it's been 50 turns, uh, but the pace of the campaign in Warhammer 1 is certainly slower than it is in Warhammer 3. Like in Warhammer 3, uh, a lot of things can happen very, very quickly, and they don't stop happening. Um, and you do have AI factions that can be extremely aggressive. This also happens in Warhammer 2. I mean, don't get me wrong, the AI is still very much biased against you, even in Warhammer 1, yeah. by the nature of the fact that top knots are in the middle of the damned empire after sacking, over, uh, sacking this particular settlement over here. Uh, but, but even though that's certainly the case, the Empire does certainly feel like powerhouse in Warhammer 1 in a way that is absolutely not in Warhammer 3. Because, well, the Dwarves and Greenskins are just busily slurring each other, the Wood Elves are the Wood Elves, and Bretonia, well, Bretonia is not going to necessarily achieve a whole lot. So that most powerful faction, though very divided, of course, is the Empire. I think that's one of the key points. The Empire feels like it is the most powerful faction in the damn setting, which I should point out, it actually is in the lore. You know, for all the mockery the Empire might have, and for all the, uh, uh, for all the, the people weak. that kick down the Empire in the lore, Draw the Empire off. is still the most powerful economic uh, and political, military powerhouse True in the entire setting. It takes both the Skaven, it, it, uh, no, it takes Nagash, the Skaven, and the entire might of chaos to bring it down during the course Boy, of the Sigma. end. So you can understand that this is a faction that has a great deal of power, a great deal of potential, and that's how they should be like. But that's not how they are in Warhammer 2, and especially not in Warhammer 3. Like, the Empire in Warhammer 3 just serves as a target to be bullied by a significant number of factions. And that therein lies the issue for them. Another thing that ends up helping the Empire, especially in Warhammer 1, are the chapter objectives, which Creative Assembly seems to be bringing back these kind of chapter objectives for Total War Pharaoh. And while they may, may not give you the kind of rewards that you, we do have uh, over here, like a significant amount of money that you can gain, so like 6,000 just for completing the chapter objectives and a 1,000 for every single bonus objective, there are still quite men. a few benefits. While it's certainly slow in terms of growth, it's not necessarily a big issue. One, thing's to one of the things to point out about the Warhammer 1 
because you are not, because while you can have a lot of money, the structures themselves can cost you a significant amount, playing a more passive campaign in Warhammer 1 can work out. While you won't have as many heroes, just playing a campaign with a handful of provinces is not necessarily a horrible experience, and overextending yourself, trying to take a huge amount of territory, as you see quite commonly done in Warhammer Warhammer free is something that's going to bite you in the ass. In case you're wondering as to why I have two uh, different blacksmiths, it's because I built the first one over here in Altdorf, and, well, it is ideal to have one in a minor settlement because you want to build other stuff in Altdorf that's more important over there. I thirst. So you can, it, like, you can see that the Empire was designed to take advantage of a more limited, slower experience. That's why it's fine for the Empire, for instance, to get artillery um, at uh, artillery at t a tier four settlement, uh, as opposed to tier three. That's why it's fine that the Empire's early game roster is not necessarily that strong, because well, they are in a fairly strong geographic position, where they, uh, at least when it comes to playing their campaigns. Uh, they are in a fairly strong geographic position, uh, uh, position, and their foes are actually the ones that have issues. Like, if you're playing a vampire campaign, it is a genuine struggle to deal with the full might of the empire, because they're quite likely going to unite all against you and wipe you out. Though, of course, there are always problems. Like, one of the things that I certainly don't miss about Warhammer 1 is the quest system for items. Yeah, that is not a great system because, like, for instance, oh, you want to get the Rune Fag, which is an item that Carl Franz should get listen, early on in his campaign. Good fucking short. luck getting that particular alliance with Norland that is required to achieve <laughs> that particular objective. Not quite sure what Creative Assembly was thinking about that, but that is one of the problems. Like, say what you will about Warhammer 3, the fact we don't have to do these kind of annoying quest objectives in order to get the items is certainly beneficial, especially when you're considering uh, uh, getting other legendary lords in order to be able uh, to pick up uh, their items, Sigmarite potentially. So it does make for a better ex experience to fully equip out uh, your legendary lords or to get their Sigmarite special items in a campaign in Warhammer 3. But if you're talking about playing a more limited campaign, if you're looking at uh, to play a campaign as the Empire where you actually don't feel like you're getting kicked every single goddamn step of, step of the way, Warhammer 1 does offer a better experience. I should also point out that what motivated me to make this particular video was a comment, a comment I saw in the I Hate Saurus video where s someone was using the speech from Rome 1, so it's like, okay, I'll take that, edit it, put it in uh, 11 labs, and make it work. Gotta appreciate the person who did that. Uh, I'll post a link to their channel in the description below. But anyway, Questine here, signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and enable notifications, and stay tuned for more.